Well, thank you. All right. Um, hey, hey, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to go ahead and get started today. I want to respect um, everyone's time. My name is Tawny Walling. I'm with the Guardian Ad Litem Foundation of Tampa Bay. And I know that we have um, a bunch of folk on here that might not be volunteer child advocates or with the Guardian Ad Litem program. So welcome to everybody. Um, the Guardian Ad Litem Foundation is the, the nonprofit um, separate 501c3 from the Guardian Ad Litem program here in um, Circuit 6, uh, which is Pinellas and Pasco counties. We're really, really glad that you're all here. Um, our website is www.herotoachild.org if you are interested in learning more about us. I will add for those of us who are guardian ad litems or CAMs that because we do have folks who are on this meeting uh, who are not part of the guardian ad litem program that I would ask that you respect the confidentiality of your cases and make sure that if you're talking about a specific instance that you do not use any real names and you make sure that that's anonymous. Um, I'm really excited about our chat today. I am also a volunteer child advocate as well as being working for the foundation. And I do have two children that I both are, um, who both take um, medicine. And I've always had a lot of questions. So um, obviously many of you probably attended our conversations that we had um, earlier with Dr. Bloom. And uh, she suggested that we um, reach out to Dr. Ra Ra Raul Mejera he received his um, medical degree from the, from the Medical University of South Carolina, and he completed five years of postdoctoral training in psychiatry. He's a really respected member of the medical community, and he was recently awarded with the University of South Florida Marsani College of Medicine Department of Psychiatry Alumni Achievement Award. He's also received uh, numerous awards for his work with children and teens in the foster care system as well. And he's the medical director at the children's home. Some of you might have kids who are within the children's home network. Um, and he's a psychiatric consultant to the XFL Professional Football League and the CEO and chief physician executive for the National Center for Performance Health. So in other words, he's a super busy guy and we are really very grateful to have him today to join us and to share his expertise. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Dr. Raul to talk to us a little bit. And I would ask that um, you let him get through his presentation. Feel free to use the chat to ask questions as he goes. Um, and then we'll have a question and answer time at the end. Dr. Raul. Tony, thank you very much. Good day, everyone. Great to be with you. Uh, certainly honored to be able to spend a little bit of time with y'all uh, today. And certainly for the volunteers on the call, thank you very much for everything that you do each and every day for the benefit of our community's children. So the topic today is Chill Pill. And that name was purposely chosen because in my beginning work in foster care dating back to 1997, I had a case manager who brought a child to me and used that phrase that the reason she was bringing her child to me was because she needed a chill pill for him. The reason I wanted to mention that uh, at the very beginning to you is that unfortunately in our society and culture right now, we use these euphemisms as a way of describing psychiatric care, psychiatric treatment, or even people who may be struggling with depression and anxiety. And I just want to educate, counsel, recommend. Uh, we are all guilty of it that, you know, when phrases are used such as someone's off their rocker or they got a screw loose, uh, to really avoid using that, those types of terms because they are not really helpful and help to actually further stigmatize the topics that we're trying to change. And in my mind, it is analogous to if a woman who had breast cancer and we refer to her as lumpy. I don't think anyone would like that. So throughout the presentation today, you are going to see the word chill pill at the very top of each slide. And that is designed to serve as a reminder so we don't use these words. 
and certainly also understanding that we all, and whether it's our, us as individuals or our families of origin, people who may be themselves uh, dealing with psychiatric issues. And that's what we're trying to destigmatize and frankly normalize in our culture and society in this day and time. I wanna begin our conversation this, uh, this day with recognizing the Honorable Tracy Sheehan. Judge Sheehan was a friend, mentor, a tireless activist for children in foster care, as well as for domestic violence. She was a close friend. She lost her life December 2019, unexpectedly and suddenly. And she serves personally for me as someone, as a guiding light for advocacy that I do myself. And frankly, the reason that I'll, why I'm even here with you this morning. As Tawny had already described to you what my professional role is. So some of the consulting work that I do is also with Major League Baseball as well as the National Football League. I know some folks on the call mentioned Pasco County. We also do some work for Pasco County Sheriff at this time. And another program I'll tell you about in a little bit is called eCare for Kids. So Latin phrase, those of you that know Latin would know what this means. It means first do no harm and is part of the Hippocratic Oath. And this, this is something since I took this oath in graduating medical school that I take very seriously. And I would highly recommend as you all are working with your children and a, a provider, a therapist, psychiatrist, anyone who is saying something as a recommendation, the question one should ask themselves is are we potentially creating any more harm for this child? Because that is something we definitely do not ever want to do. And in my work as a supervisor of residents of a Department of Psychiatry at the University of South Florida in Tampa, uh, this is one of the main principles that I tried to instill into uh, folks that I was educating. So in my mind, when we think about medications and we think about human behavior, and in particular, the behavior of children, we do not often enough think about the brain. Behavior does not come just randomly out of thin air. It, it is rooted in our brain, it's rooted in the anatomy, it's rooted in the physiology. And even if right now I asked you all that how many chambers of the heart are there, you probably would be able to answer that with some accuracy. But if I asked you what were the three major parts of the brain, I'm not so sure that we all would be able to answer that with the equal amount of confidence. So let's chat for a minute about even before the baby is born, pre-birth. So what happens at about one month of gestation while the baby is in the womb, the neural tube begins to form. The neural tube is what is the prototype for the development of the spinal cord and for the brain because the two are linked. And the way the brain develops, think of it developing from south to north, meaning that the spinal cord develops first, then the brain develops. And the, actually the brain continues to grow till about age 25. That has very direct ramifications for the children you all serve. Along with that is the emotional and social development. This is something that's happening at a very young age and even happening pre-birth in terms of what is the mother's expectation of the child before the child is even born. So all these variables and factors go into the overall development, both physical, emotional, and social of that child way before there's even any consideration of them entering foster care. So brain anatomy. So the three main areas of the brain are the brain stem, the cerebellum, and the cerebrum. The brain stem is located near the base of the brain and is attached a very close proximity to the cerebellum and, and is act, attached to the cerebrum. The reason the brain stem is important is that people who are undergoing traumas, very often this is where a lot of the reactivity lives is in the brainstem. The brainstem is responsible for controlling blood pressure and heart rate. So a child potentially who is experiencing fear and trauma 
is in terms of their brain physiology is going to be spending a lot of time in their brain stem and their habits that develop in terms of reactivity to external stimuli that children and adults do or endure who have been exposed to trauma and other difficult things in their lives. The cerebellum is a part of the brain that is responsible for motor movement and coordination. The cerebrum are, is what you see on the picture in front of you is the, is the four lobes of the brain. We are not going to go into detailed explanation of all the lobes of the brain, but just know that the emotional center of the brain itself is housed deep in the cerebrum. I wanted you all to have a reference point for how the brain relates to human behavior. So recall that I stated earlier that the brain continues to develop till about age 25. And remember further that I said the brain develops from south to north, meaning that when it is growing and developing, it's developing from the spinal cord up to the top of the cerebrum. So the last thing to develop is the prefrontal cortex. You're thinking to yourself, why is this important? Well, the reason it's important, especially related to children and adolescents, is think of the prefrontal cortex as the senior management center of the brain meaning that's where decision making comes from. If you or I dr are driving down the interstate and a car pulls out in front of you and you may have a momentary impulse out of anger and frustration and then think to yourself, wow, I wanna run that guy off the road because he pulled out in front of me, but something stops you from doing that. That is your prefrontal cortex that controls your impulses, your judgment, your decision making. Right, because you think to yourself, if I pull out, if, if I do something to this guy that's pulled out in front of me, there's a good chance I could go to jail, I could be in an accident, I could lose my license. Well, remember that I said impulse control. So if that's not fully developed till age 25, this is the area of the brain that is primarily responsible for trying to mitigate suicidal impulses. Right? When stress and other things happen to us, this is what will help contain that, the prefrontal cortex. And there are also other variables that impact the functioning of the prefrontal cortex. Alcohol, drugs, medications, stress, medical illnesses, and other things that can have an impact. So if we distill down further into the chemistry of the brain, let's think for a minute that what comprises the brain itself? Well, neurons are the cell body in the brain. And one neuron con co you know, communicates with another neuron through what's called the synaptic cleft. And what you see in the image, the little yellow dots that you see are where the neurotransmitters work in terms of communicating between the two neurons. Neurotransmitters are what medications and psychotropic medications impact. The other thing that I wanted to uh, refer to y'all was that when we were talking about brain development, between the ages of zero to three, there are about one million new neuronal connections happening every second in the brain of that toddler from zero to three. One million new neuronal connections happening. That's a profound number of connections. There is no other period of time in the history of one's brain or one's life that there's so many connections that are happening. That's why the experiences of a toddler between zero to three are critically important. So we talked about a neurotransmitter. So think of a neurotransmitter essentially as a chemical that helps communicate between two neurons or between a neuron and a muscle, or between a neuron and a gland in the body. That is what allows for there to be communication. Neuro meaning neuron, transmitter meaning transmitting a message. And that is done through electrical impulses. So let's transition on to understanding a little bit about human behavior, in particular the behavior of children and adolescents. So the way that I try to conceptualize human behavior 
is thinking through the biological factors, the psychological factors, and the social factors. So what do we mean by these variables? Well, the biological factors have to do with our genetics, right? Just like our hair color, our eye color, we are born with certain predispositions to certain things to include psychiatric illness. Psychological factors are variables that are, how do we feel about ourselves, our self-esteem? Are we depressed? Our social factors have to do with our social relationships. What school are we in? Do we get to be outside enough? Are we getting fresh air? Or are we watching the computer screen all day long? So these are three different areas that I use to help me figure out clinically how to best address attention and treatment plan options when I'm considering the care of my patients. Some of you probably know who this young lady is. Her name is Simone Biles and she is the Olympic gymnast who has won a record number of Olympic gold medals. You may not know about her is that she grew up in foster care. At age three, she was adopted by her grandfather and the grandfather's wife because she had been born uh, to a mother who was addicted to alcohol and drugs. And she and her sister were raised by the grandfather and his wife at approximately age three, I believe. And I include these slides periodically to set expectations. We should never ever give up on the child irrespective of what they have endured or the background they have. She is only one example of someone who has persevered through their lives by growing up in foster care. So let's go back to the biopsychosocial model that I mentioned earlier. So just to get a little bit more specific, and certainly there, I've listed three things here. There are many more biological and psychological and social factors uh, that are at play here. But just for your understanding, I wanted to mention these three items. So biologically, the amygdala is the emotional control center of the brain housed deep inside the cerebrum. It, it, it also is responsible for fear responses. And these responses over time or how we all respond to fear and anxiety producing situations. Children who grow up with traumatic backgrounds have their amygdala on overdrive. Their amygdala is always responding. And eventually, if you think about any machine always responding, like if your air conditioner at home ran continuously, sooner or later, it's gonna break down. And so that's an oversimplification of the concept, but I wanted to share that with y'all. The next is the psychological dimensions. And so one of the areas that children who are in foster care, who have been ne neglected and traumatized, struggle with their sense of their self-worth. This is a huge protective factor as they get older. Now, mind you that this protective factor has been compromised because they experience feelings of rejection and they question their self-worth and their self-value. They may not be so intellectual about it, depending on their age, right? Because this is an, an abstract concept that does not manifest itself till much later in adolescence. But I can assure you that even young children are feeling these types of, of issues. Socially, going through trauma impacts the formation of secure attachments and meaningful relationships. And you think to yourself, okay, well, Dr. Mayor, we know that. Well, you may know that, but again, I cannot stress enough as to the value of these types of relationships being protective factors in helping the overall emotional well being of that child. So let's distill down a little bit further into some specific behaviors. Again, you all, I'm sure, and the children that you serve have encountered these common occurrences, biological factors, right? It, it is helpful to think through these things uh, when we're trying to conceptualize how we want to approach treating and helping our children. Sleep disruption is a very common thing in children who have been traumatized. Impulse control, for the reasons that I identified with you earlier. One of all, it, first of all, is the fact that the brain's not totally developed till age 25. Now, this is not intended to offer any excuses 
uh, for their behavior. But when you superimpose that if the brain has not already been developed and then there's on top of that traumatic events that happen, that's further going to wreak havoc on the brain's ability to control impulses. Then we also have as a symptom over or under eating some psychological variables, feelings of anxiety and fearfulness, right? Normal feelings to fear if uh, repeated traumas are taking place by the mother's boyfriend or a biological father who is repeatedly traumatizing a child. Depression is a common psychological reaction. Vigilance, hypervigilance to other people. That's a common thing that you notice when, when children, when you approach a child who may react you know, with, you know, an adverse reaction of not wanting to greet you or to run away. This has become a uh, customized reaction that they have developed as a way to cope. And these are things that we have to help them with. Socially, they may be oppositional. They may have disruptive attachments because they have not had the ability to form these meaningful relationships through secure attachments as well as receiving appropriate bonding from their caregivers. One of the other manifestations is poor academic performance in the schools. So I wanna spend a couple more minutes on this slide to help describe to you all that in my over 23 years of working with children in foster care, I probably have spent more time taking children off of medications than I have putting them on medications. I am a firm believer in medications. However, medications in foster youth, in particular, in my mind, are overutilized regularly. And there's a lot of different reasons as to why that is, and we will go over some of those. So when you have a child that is on medications, you should be asking yourself what symptoms are trying or attempting to be targeted are these potential symptoms short-lived? Maybe they just got moved to a new foster home or a new placement and all of a sudden now, they're having some sleep disruption. Well, in my judgment, in my mind, that's not the cause to start immediately medicating a child. We need to be very thoughtful and methodical in how we approach these symptoms. And so I wanted to share that as well also when there are disruptive social attachments, when siblings are separated, when a child's significant objects in their lives, whether it's their clothes or their games or their toys are not with them. Think about it from the vantage point of the child. They don't own real estate, they don't own a car, but then when they're changed from one home to the other, they are all of a sudden expected to go to the new placement, you know, as if nothing has changed in their life whatsoever. So I believe that we really as adults, as well as the system of care overall, has some very unreasonable expectations of these children. And I can't stress that enough. So let's look for a minute overall at the history of psychiatric medications. So lithium actually was discovered in 1871 as a way to treat mania. Let's talk about lithium for a minute. Lithium in the field of psychiatry and mood regulation is a very commonly used medication. There's a lot of research that says lithium is probably one of the best medications to prevent suicide. Now, that's excellent that that exists. However, the challenges with lithium as well as lithium carbonate are this. Lithium is a medication that's referred to as having a narrow therapeutic window. Let me say that again, a narrow therapeutic window or a narrow therapeutic index. What this means is that lithium is a medication that when it is prescribed, blood levels need to be monitored. And usually the levels need to be between about 0 0.5 and 1.5. If that those levels can very quickly change depending on hydration, depending on diet, depending on many other things. I am not a huge advocate of using lithium in our children in foster care. Certainly there can be, I would never be absolute, there can be indications for it. But the reason I'm so absolute in that 
is that because the blood levels have to be monitored, and this is something that one cannot fool around with because if levels got toxic, meaning that the levels exceeded 1.5 and they got higher, they can be life-threatening and cause damage to the heart, lungs, and kidneys. Remember that the conversation this morning is an oversimplification, but to make these points. So let's go on to 1937 when benzedrine was discovered. So Dr. George Bradley actually was a pediatrician uh, who later became a psychiatrist. Uh, this was up in Rhode Island and he actually, the name of the home uh, was the Bradley home, I believe. It was, it was a situation where his family had some relationships and it was essentially a group home where his own daughter lived because she had some physical ailments. And what he discovered purely by chance is that benzedrine was a medication that was given for headaches. And so when the medication was given to some of the children for headaches, he discovered that it modified their behavior in terms of they, they became less erratic and had better impulse control. So that was some of the history related to amphetamines being used as a way to control symptoms. Next in the 1940s and 50s, we have antihistamines. Some of your children may actually be on antihistamines like either diphenhydramine, which is known as Benadryl, or Vistaril, which is an antihistamine as well. And these, one of the side effects of these medications is sedation. And that uh, the process to cause sedation happens at that neurotransmitter level. We won't go into the details of all of that, but that was very directly related to the development of chlorpromazine, which is also known as Thorazine, which is in the class of antipsychotic medications. So that was the first antipsychotic medication because one of the properties that it had was sedation. So I wanted to share that with y'all because the reason history is always important to me is that you know we need to understand where we've been, where we are now to help us figure out where we should go in the future. So it wasn't until 1956 that Ritalin was discovered and the use of it took place to help address symptoms of inattention and hyperactivity. So let's review some facts about psychotropic medications and foster children. Number one, the topic of one in four children in foster care between the ages of six and seven are administered at least one psychotropic medication. That is a very high number compared to the general population. Second, we also have a number of children who are given combinations of two, three, or four medications at the time. In my experience and my study of the re literature, there is no clear indication where two or three different psychotropic medications of different classes of medications are going to make a significant difference. Again, that's a very general statement I am making. Each situation should be taken on an individual state and understanding. The next item is the monitoring of children on foster care is very frequently haphazard and there's a lot of different reasons for that. And one of the reasons for it is that very often is that where the children are receiving services and resources, maybe the psychiatrist has left or changed or the care manager has changed or the guardian ad litem has changed and moved on. So there's not a continuity of information. Uh, medications frequently get renewed without there being any oversight of the child having been seen. One thing that I forgot to mention earlier in my introduction is that overall, I have been in practice for about 30 years. And in terms of in the Tampa Bay, Florida area, I've been the medical director of two uh, major organizations. One in Hillsborough County is called Grace Point Wellness, uh, formerly known as Mental Health Care, and over in Pinellas County was medical director for Directions for Living, uh, which is a community mental health center in Pinellas County. So when I am talking to you all about this is coming from the vantage point, not only of as a treating psychiatrist, 
but also as someone who has been in positions of management and who has observed the system of care and how it works, and unfortunately sometimes how it doesn't work. And then the final bullet is often these drugs are prescribed without there being clear, clear symptoms uh, as to who should authorize or even what the symptoms are that we're trying to address. So that's why I would encourage each of you is that when there's a recommendation that comes forward for, their to, for your child to be on a medication is asking why is that and asking that in a respectful way, of course. So the one class of medications that I wanted to specifically talk about today was the antipsychotics. Uh, and why would I pick the topic of antipsychotics? Well, I, the reason I picked that is that because in my mind, again, antipsychotics are medicines that I prescribe, that I have used, I will continue to use, firmly believe in them, but there needs to be a clear path as to why we are using these medications. So the history of antipsychotics, as I mentioned earlier, the first one was chlorpromazine, also known as Thorazine. What has happened over the history of time is that now antipsychotics are referred to in different classes, two major classes. One is called the first generation antipsychotics, and then secondly is the second generation anti antipsychotics. So the first generation antipsychotics are medications like Haldol, Navain, those types of medications. They are used primarily in schizophrenia. They are also used in certain conditions to control Tourette's syndrome and other symptoms like that. They are less frequently used now because we have the second generation antipsychotics. When the second generation antipsychotics came out approximately in the early 1990s with the use of risperidol, also known as risperidone, the initial uh, publicity was that, wow, this is a great medication with hardly no side effects. And everybody jumped on the bandwagon because of the final bullet that you see on the slide, because of aggressive marketing campaigns by the drug manufacturers. What we have since learned since the early 1990s is that these medications do have side effects. The main side effects are they can cause weight gain, which can lead to diabetes and a whole slew of other metabolic concerns when these medications are prescribed. Again, I'm not saying that children should not be on them. They are used in pediatric psychiatry but there needs to be thoughtful reasons as to why we are using them. So the reasons, some of the reasons why medications are gone to instead of other treatments is bullet number one, is that people and children can't get into the appropriate services that they need to get into for a myriad of reasons. But again, that someone as you as a child advocate or as a guardian ad litem can definitely impact that by encouraging that the case manager get that child some help and assessment and engage in some type of psychotherapeutic intervention. Number two, the inadequate supply of people who are experienced in working with children. Uh, if there is a therapist involved, it's okay for you to ask, do you have experience in working with children? What is that level of experience? And that's to include physicians as well. Uh, the third bullet, limited knowledge about foster care. For someone who does not work in foster care, whether it's a physician or a therapist, understanding the system can be quite complex. Lack of coordination of care. This is one of the greatest areas of need is that there where is extremely poor communication when children are transferred even within county one county to another county where appointments are not made in a timely way. There are assumptions are made by people involved in the system that the next individual is gonna coordinate that care. I have seen this lead to devastating and deathly consequences. Please be involved in the coordination of care and ensuring your children are getting the help that they need to get. The next bullet, aggressive marketing campaigns by drug manufacturers. I fully support drug manufacturers. Without them, we wouldn't have all the medications, whether they're psychotropics, whether they're cancer medications. 
However, the United States of America is one of the few countries in the world that allows TV marketing of medications. And so what happens with that is that even foster parents and other people, because they have seen something on TV, are then coming to the forefront and making these requests of the physicians to prescribe these certain medications. And this is not the reason for a child, especially a child in foster care, to be on a medication because somebody has recently seen an ad on it. So the list here is a list of some of the second generation antipsychotics. Remember that I said these were the newer medications that have been developed in the last 20 years. We're not going to go through each medication, but I mentioned earlier the risperidone, that was the first one. Early on also was clozapine. That is a medication that is also used in schizophrenia and requires uh, frequent blood work and oversight. Uh, it can be a great medication if it is monitored appropriately and correctly. So I wanted to share with you all a article that I ran across from Health Affairs, which is a national magazine from 2016. Very interesting information here that reviewed uh, antipsychotics and foster care. The study period ran from 2005 to 2010. And what they determined was that in the year 2008, 9.26 of a percentage of foster youth, and I don't know the sample size, I'm sorry about that, is were on antipsychotic medications. They then compared that to children who had private pay insurance and the number was less than 1%. And then also in 2008 on the Medicaid side of things is that children who were in Medicaid but not in foster care the number of them that were on antipsychotics was 1.86%. And so there is a ton of data that is out there reflecting this type of information. And as I previously had said, <clears throat> the concerns related to these antipsychotics is that three fourths of them were never tested to gauge the risk for diabetes because remember, that a child is at risk for diabetes when they gain weight. And sometimes we know that children in foster care do not get enough physical activity, are not given the most quality foods and things. So that's yet even before being on an antipsychotic medication, they are predisposed to the development of diabetes by virtue of poor exercise and poor diet. When I was in residency, at Georgia Health Sciences Center in Augusta, Georgia for part of my training. At that time, I worked on pediatrics and rarely would I see a case or a hospitalization of a child being hospitalized for pediatric hypertension. Pediatric hypertension now is elevated to levels that we've never seen before. The reason for that primarily is weight gain and inactivity. And that final bullet says that antipsychotics can cause rapid weight gain and predispose an individual three more times likely to develop diabetes. Let's briefly just look at the history of foster care. Recall what I said earlier, that it's important for us to understand where we've been to determine where we're going. So, so often, as you all know, in the founding of our country was very heavily influenced by the British. So essentially in the 1500s, Children were treated as indentured service, uh, service providers, in, indentured slaves, whether they were with their families of origin or not with their families of origin. Often the reason that a child uh, wound up, quote, in foster care was not because of abuse or neglect, but was because of the death of a parent. So almshouses were homes that also started in the UK, but then the concept also came over to the United States an uh, almshouse was a home uh, that housed children who had physical disabilities, who could not be at their physical home. And that was actually the name, uh, that was the type of home when I mentioned earlier, uh, the physician who discovered the Benzedrine. It was an almshouse uh, that was responsible for where children were. It was not until 1807 in the case of Mary Ellen Wilson, where at that period of time, it was finally realized that children at least deserved 
equal rights, if not more rights to the compared to animals. This is no disrespect to animals, but in our culture, in our society, we have more shelter beds, probably even more advocacy for animals than we do for children. So Mary Ellen Wilson's case was responsible as the forerunner for creating some changes in legislation for which to better care for children. In 1853, a priest by the name of Charles Loring Brace was the one that more formalized through his church the treatment of taking care of foster care children. And this is entirely my opinion and my judgment, not affiliated with any entity on this call, is that we have really gotten away from looking to our spiritual organizations, whether they be Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, whatever they be, in helping support our children and their progress. And it is through his church that he created the Children's Aid Society. This is what led to, is commonly referred to as the orphan trains, where children were sent from, uh, with, on trains, primarily to the Midwest, to work on farms. Again, they didn't necessarily have the best rights, but were used to as, as work labor. Those trains also came to Florida, the Florida United Methodist Children's Home. I believe there's some folks on the call uh, from that organization was one of the spots where the orphan trains came to. That eventually involved to individual foster homes where the government started paying individuals to take in foster kids. I wanted to share that with y'all because those of you that don't know that, it, it's important to understand where we've been. So let's talk about specifically how medications get started. So one, one of the ways is what's called the temporary statutory authority that DCF can use uh, to continue a medication. These are very specific and are outlined there on your slide and I will not read those off a uh, SIP refers to a residential bed that a child may be placed in. CSU stands for Crisis Stabilization Unit. Please take a second to read this slide. Again, it refers to uh, the cost that is involved in caring for children in foster care. And this data uh, refers primarily actually to the majority of it refers to the use of psychotropic medications. And that's a substantial difference in terms of what the numbers are that the foster care children represent versus the amount that they account for in the mental health expenditures. So this is Steve Jobs. What some of you may not know is that he was born, uh, his biological parents were two graduate students who were not married. Uh, his biological father was a Syrian Muslim. His mother was a US citizen and the mother's uh, parents uh, did not want her to marry uh, her, his father. So as a result of that, Steve Jobs was placed in foster care uh, and grew up with the Jobs family. And so, and you all are familiar with his story. Obviously he tragically lost his life early at a young age as well. So again, I can't stress this to y'all enough is children in foster care, we should have very high expectations of them uh, for there are great things that they can and do accomplish each and every day. And just for the record that the images that are being used here belong certainly to the folks uh, that took the images and not to myself. Let's talk a minute about assent versus informed consent. Assent refers to the fact that if I have a 15 year old child in front of me and I want to start that child on an antidepressant, certainly I will go through the filing of the form of which to do that, but I will also discuss that medication with the child. If the child gives his or her assent, that is what that is, where I have just talked to the child about that. Informed consent is a legal process. So these are the entities that can give the informed consent. I'm assuming you all know all of these already. We already did cover the temporary statutory authority as well. And in the state of Florida, if you're 18, or under the age of 18, 
you yourself as an individual cannot consent to agreeing to take psychotropic medication. You can give assent. And recall, that's different than informed consent. So what can you all do as, as guardians, as advocates, as people in the community? First and foremost, you can help spread the message. Early on in my career, I realized when I would tell people when I was medical director at the Joshua House uh, starting in 1997, and that ran for about 14 years, uh, I would tell people the work that I did, and I would get the typical pat on the back and say, oh, you just must have a great heart uh, for children. And rarely did an individual ever want to learn any more about what foster care was about, because this is a difficult topic to discuss. And so what I am requesting, again, I can't thank you all enough for your volunteer work, but also is to ask questions of the people that are involved in that foster child's lives. What I soon realized early on in my career was that when people would make those comments to me of gratitude, and I stopped and thought about that, and I concluded that actually, and even to this day, I actually get more out of my work with children than I can ever give them. And they serve to motivate me personally. And I think that each child has a unique story and we need to take the time to listen to that child's journey, not make predetermined decisions or conclusions about where he or she should go. Number two, hold individuals in the system accountable. Yes, foster care system between care management, between the clinicians, between managing entities, between whoever it is, is a frustrating thing. It, it is a commitment that it is your job and your responsibility to be that voice for that child and to take that very seriously. It, it, it is frankly, in my mind, a God-given right. Uh, be respectful, always. It's okay. I welcome people challenge, challenging me. Over my career, I have had guardian ad litems, care managers, parents challenge. I welcome it. Any clinician should welcome that. Given the nature of psychiatry, we don't have the ability to do blood work and to pull up an x-ray to define what depression and anxiety looks like. Also, know your limits and your boundaries. Do not accept mediocrity. For too long, children in the system of care have, have been exposed to mediocrity. And one of the fundamental reasons why that still is tolerated is that they don't vote. They have no representation for what to do for them. And this is what the Guardian Ad Litem program, as well as the foundation is about, is to be a voice for them. Educate yourself from reliable resources about medications. Ask questions. Uh, call me if you need to. Our number I'll provide at the end if you have a question or a concern. I ask about what are the side effects profiles of the medications that they are asking and have already educated yourself, again, that is your right and your duty to do that. Ask why certain medications are being chosen. Assist in getting information through prescriber. Remember what I said earlier, that the lack of information, if I am sitting in the prescriber's chair, this happens to me all the time and will continue to happen where we get a paucity of information. So I am then expected to make a decision involving the physical and emotional well-being of this child based on a limited amount of information. So you can be very helpful in getting information to the prescriber. I came up with this acronym called CARP. With your children that you're serving, be consistent, be authentic, be reliable, and be predictable. Children do not forget. Children in foster care are marginalized somehow for thinking that they really don't have an emotional awareness of what's going on. If you tell them that you're going to be there Friday at 10 o'clock, that even that six-year-old is gonna anticipate you being there Friday at 10 o'clock. Stick to your word. If you can't have that communicated directly to the child somehow, that you can't maintain that. Do not be distracted in the interchange with them. Please do not be on your phone or looking at paperwork when you're interacting with that child. Give that child the kindness of your time to be there in the moment. Be reliable and be predictable. 
So a couple of resources I wanted to share with you in case you do not already know them. The Florida Pediatric Psychiatry Medline is a free resource that is available. The phone number is listed. That is managed by the University of South Florida where folks can call into it if they have a question about psychotropic medications. eCare for Kids is a direct partnership that my company, the National Center for Performance Health, is involved in with USF. Marie McPherson and Sabrina Singh are the folks at USF that handled that. And that is a partnership where we provide expert child psychiatric consultation for pediatricians using telemedicine. There is no cost to anyone for this service as of right now, as because it is grant based. And here is our information. Certainly our organization is available for seminars, educational trainings, uh, whatever you think might be helpful to your organization or the entity and organizations that you represent. Again, please allow me to thank you from my heart to each of you for the work and the commitment that you're doing and for taking the time to be on this call. Thank you and we will now entertain any questions or concerns if we have time to do that. Thank you so much. That was uh, amazing. We're seeing a lot of great uh, stuff happening on the chat and I definitely know that folks are um, like really minds expanding. Really great. Um, if you have a few minutes to take some questions, we do have some questions. How are you doing on time? I'm fine. I'm okay. happy to. Okay, perfect. Um, so we had, a, we had a couple of questions. Some of them were answered while you were going. Um, but um, so I think um, the first question, I think you really, um, I think you did answer it, but just in case you have any additional thought, um, it was from Dulce. Uh, what should BCAs do if they think their child is being over medicated or doesn't need meds? I heard you say that you really want folks to like engage and that that's something that's really important. So I'm imagining that that's part of it, but do you have anything else that you would like to say about that? Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, Tony, you're saying that if, uh, if the guardian ad litem senses that? Yes. Yes, so the beginning point is communicating with the care manager. And if that is not occurring in a timely way of ultimately getting your concern known to the prescriber. Every, everyone in this world has a boss. And if there are concerns you are noticing about over medication, uh, those need to be brought to the forefront of the prescriber. And whatever you've got to do to beg, borrow, and steal. And I know that many of these organizations, it's hard to get to the prescriber, but that information needs to be gotten to him or her uh, because they may have no idea. That information may never be communicated to them. And I know the majority of the child psychiatrists in our community in this part of West Central Florida, and most of them are very reasonable people and will want to know that information. And if not, and if it's an agency, each agency has a medical director or a CEO. These are these types of things that you cannot sit on because sitting on them is what leads to bad consequences. Great, thank you. Um, we just had a question and I actually have this question too and I'm sure probably a bunch of you do from Robin. Uh, do you recommend food allergy and sensitivity testing in cases of aggressive behavior? Um, and what about metals testing? Yeah, sure, so uh, great question. Uh, part of the answer will lie always uh, would refer that to the actual physician or primary care physician responsible for taking care of that child. I don't know that I would automatically start doing that. There needs to be a thought through reason for food allergies. But just if somebody is just having aggressive behavior just to say that we need to engage in heavy metal testing or food allergies, I'm not so sure about that, but if there is an indication that there's a certain response to watermelons, bananas, peanuts, or whatever it is, then yes, that would be recommended. And also on the heavy metal side of things, this, if, as an example, if there's been exposure to lead-based lead paint, then yes, that should be considered. So again, the money lies in the history and what the child has been exposed to. Okay, great. Um, what is your uh, position on combining meds or, or not meds along with Eastern practices like acupuncture and meditation? Yes, great question. So, uh, you know, one of the things about my background that I did not share in the beginning is that I was actually born in India 
and immigrated here when I was five. So feel like I have an understanding of the Eastern view of the world. My own personal belief, and I say this all the time, is if my own doctor told me to go uh, outside to a park and uh, run around the tree 10 times, then it would help me feel better. Uh, I would go do that as long as it's causing no harm. Remember that I said in the slide first, do no harm. If there is an intervention, whether it's acupuncture, meditation, prayer, that is absolutely the meditation, prayer, quieting the mind is something that every child should be taught. So yes, I'm a firm believer in it as long as the provider is someone that has been vetted in terms of their credentials, because there's a lot of snake oil out there in that. Okay, great, thank you. Um, do you have any, uh, if folks are interested in, um, in reading more, do you, do you recommend any um, books or any places that they could go to, to learn more about this? Yeah, off the top of my head, I don't, but I can certainly get you Perfect. some information and things. Great, we can send that out. So if that was something that you wanted, feel free to put your uh, email in the chat. Um, Pam asked, uh, could a disparity between foster care and the general population in regards to medication use be a result of higher rates of trauma? Oh yeah, that, that contributes to it for sure. But it really, in my judgment, is not sufficient to account for the significant disparity that exists. It is a, in my opinion, it is a direct result of pressures that prescribers feel uh, and minimal information. When a child is brought in, you know, Johnny is hitting everybody in school uh, and things, but what the prescriber never hears uh, that number one is a significant trauma history, and number two, that Johnny has been in 10 foster care homes. And just by even virtue of getting that child on medications is gonna be no guarantee that it's gonna address the aggressive behavior. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes a lot of, that makes a lot of sense. Um, okay, we had one, uh, one other question is um, for, and I, I think that this is probably way more complicated, but for folks, for kids who have P PTSD or acute adjustment disorder, how, how, do, um, how would a volunteer child advocate sort of begin to th think about like how do they advocate for med medication or um, you know how, do, how is it determined that that's needed? Sure, well, number one, th remember that uh, uh, it is not the guardian's role to diagnose, right? Unless you carry a license, I uh, would not advise anyone diagnosing, but let's say, you know, in your observations as a guardian, you've seen enough behavior I first thing would be is to determine where all is that behavior. Is it because when there are behavioral disruptions that require medications, they are usually pretty consistent uh, behavioral disruptions that happen at school, happen at home, happen in baseball, happen in choir, whatever it may be, is to then gather that information, take it to the care manager or whatever you have to do to get it first of all in front of a licensed clinician to make that determination. That's the starting point because remember, I'm a firm believer that every child in foster care needs to have some contact or relationship with an experienced therapist who is experienced in working with children. Perfect. Um, I just had a question come in. Um, if, if it was put on a, a, a medication, you know, this person is asking how long should they be on the drugs? And I imagine that that's, uh, you know, case by case, but her point I think is fair. She says, it seems like they're put on these drugs and they never come off them. Uh, okay, yeah, let me address that. So that actually brings up another topic and that is diagnosis. You know, the thing to uh, remember is that labels and diagnoses sometimes we're very eager and the system of care is very eager to get children diagnosed and one of the reasons frankly is because of billing right if the child's being seen there has to be a claim that's submitted to Medicaid or whoever the payer may be but please remember that when these labels these children get these labels they stick with them the rest of their lives I'll tell you a specific pet peeve that I have, and that is about reactive attachment disorder. You know, maybe about 15 years ago, this diagnosis started getting uh, into vogue and became a, in my mind, a garbage bag term 
to describe any disruptive behavior. That is a profound diagnosis to make. I can, I can tell you hundreds of children that I have seen where I have eliminated that diagnosis. So number one, we want to be careful with the diagnostic labeling of children. Number two uh, is that to the question, yes, it's very situation sp specific as to the amount of time that the child should be on a medication. Yes, there are certain conditions that if it is bona fide ADHD, there is a great likelihood that that child probably will need to be on the medications the remainder of their lives, uh, even with depression and other things. But that the, the question about the duration should be periodically reevaluated. That's what we talked about, that when a child is on medications, they should be seeing the prescriber at regular intervals and there should not be just this random reauthorization of the medication without the child having been seen for six months to a year. Okay, great. So I'm gonna take two more questions that we have here. Um, and I know that there is a lot more questions y'all, um, but I wanna be really mindful of Dr. Raul's time. Um, so uh, I'm, I'll compile, I'll try to compile all these questions and maybe I can send them to you offline and we can send them out again. If you'd like to have the information for, from this uh, training, feel free to put your email address. You can send it to me privately or you can send it in the, in the group. Um, so, um, can a child refuse to take their meds because it makes them feel, you know, because they don't Absolutely. Like feel? Uh, I'm, I'm a firm believer in, in children do have rights and those rights need to be heard and uh, when possible adhered to. Every decision in medicine that is made as a, I can't answer that absolutely as to what I would do. It, every situation is, is, is unique. In my mind, every clinician should be it should be a risk versus benefits analysis. Is the benefit, if it was a 10 year old who is act, actively having auditory and visual hallucinations and the antipsychotic that I prescribed them, they didn't like how it made them feel. I would listen to them, I would talk to them about it, but I would recommend that the medication continue. Okay, great. Um, what they have a right to, Tawny, is that they have a right to a conversation with the prescriber. That right should never be denied any child. Okay, so akin to that, um, if, if the child is, is struggling and the VCA has a good relationship with the child, it, would it be appropriate for a VCA to advocate for a second opinion? Sure, yeah, okay. At, always. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, the last question that we'll have uh, today is, is it appropriate for um, a PA or a general practitioner or a pediatrician to prescribe psychiatric meds? Again, uh, it's very unique to who the prescriber is and their level of experience. The majority of the psychotropics in our country overall are prescribed by primary, primary care professionals. They are not prescribed by psychiatric professionals. Uh, is it appropriate? It could be. It depends on the experience of that provider. It depends on the amount of experience she or he had. Okay, great. Um, thank you so very, very much. We really appreciate it. Um, I just want to make, before we close, um, you know, feel free to uh, reach out. Again, everybody should have my email address. So if you didn't get a chance to send me your email address, but you would like this information, feel free to email me um, at my first name, last initial, so tawnyw at uh, galf6.org. Um, and I, I'd just like to make a, a quick plug. If you haven't gotten your backpack request in, um, we're almost full up, so make sure to, make sure to do that. Uh, we're having a drive-through backpack um, this year, so it will be a no-contact pickup, uh, and all that information is on our website. So feel free to check that out. Uh, thank you so much. I've gotten a lot of private um, thank yous, um, Dr. Raul. So we really appreciate you coming today. And um, is there anything that you would like to add before we close? No, I'm honored that you have me and continue to wish everyone good luck with taking care of our children. It's very much needed now more than ever before. Thank you so much. I hope everybody has a really wonderful day. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you.